Bibles, let's get into the Word of God together. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power. Somebody say power. power. Say love. love. Say self-discipline. Love. Let's pray. Father, today I ask in this place that you go way beyond what I can do. Holy Spirit, I ask you as the great teacher to speak to each and every one of us individually at our point of need so that we can know how to answer the attacks of the enemy. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Been on this for a number of weeks. I'm going to wrap it up today. Next Sunday, J.D. is going to be preaching. I know he's got a great message. I will be here this time. Uh, last time he preached, Trish and I got away. Uh, but I'll be here next Sunday. But looking forward to the message God puts on his heart. And then the week after, I'm going to start a new series on uh, 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 spiritual warfare called Basic Training. And so I'm going to wrap this up today. But God has been showing us. I like the NLT, which we read. It says God has given us not a spirit of fear, but power, love, and self-discipline. I like that because some translations say sound mind, which both are true. But I don't think we can have a sound mind if we don't discipline ourselves to think on the things of God. And some of us here this morning may be facing the greatest trial. In fact, I know that some of us are. The greatest trial of our faith, whether it's finances, whether it's health, whether it's a relationship issue. But let me assure you that if you choose to think on the reports of the enemy, you will suffer loss. If you choose to think on the the promises of God, which are yes and amen, even in the trial of your storm, even if it doesn't end up exactly as you have predetermined in your mind, let me assure you, you are going to have rest, you're going to have calmness, you are going to have the peace of God which supersedes understanding in the midst of your trial. And the Bible says that in patience that we get perfection. And I believe God is working perfection in each and every one of us, all right, who choose to think of promises of God. Don't let the enemy get you thinking on fear and get you afraid of what you're facing. And I know we can face some terrible things in life. Don't misunderstand me. And I'm not discounting that or, or treating it lightly, but I'm, I'm just telling you the truth, that uh, we need to be prepared to fight and to have a sound mind with power and love that God gives us. Hebrews 11:6. it says, Without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. Faith really is believing that God will reward me when I seek him. Think about that. Choosing to think on the things of God. Uh, we've talked about all kinds of fear over the past few weeks. Fear of rejection, fear of disapproval, fear of being alone, fear of abandonment, fear of financial problems, fear of failure, fear of people, doubt, worry, anger, fear of lack, health issues. We could go on and on. We don't have time to name them all, but we've talked about a few of those. And basically, when we live in fear, we're doubting that God can provide for us the way that he says that he can. And we all have that battle to fight. And again, we've either chosen, chosen to think on the things of God or chosen to think on the things of the enemy and the thing that we're facing. Now, this, this morning, I want to talk, uh, as, we, as we finish up this series, about our refuge from fear and the fight of faith that we have before us. Let me ask you a few questions. Where do you go to feel safe? Think about this. When, when I'm facing a trial, when I'm facing a hard time in my life, what's the first thing that I turn to? Uh, some people could turn to food, could turn to alcohol, drugs uh, for comfort. You may visit your psychiatrist. And listen, there's nothing wrong with seeing a good Christian psychiatrist. I think that that's probably smart for many of us. But is the first thing I do when I face a challenging moment, do I say, I got to get to the psychiatrist? We're, we're getting less than what God has for us. Certainly uh, other things can help. All right, but we need to get to God first. So what's the first thing I do when, when, when fear attacks me, when, when uh, I get a, a bad report? Um, do I become a workaholic? That's what many people do. And we just really try to really provide for ourselves, and we end up short of what God could do for us because we end up with a self-sufficient life. And so what we do is we bury ourselves in work. So many people do that. Others are addict addicted to social media. I don't know how that can happen, but it does. People get addicted. If you get on there for a few minutes, it's like, holy moly. <laughs> but people do. People get addicted to TV. People get addicted to, to uh, video games. You can get addicted to pornography. I mean, we can go on and on. But here's the thing. Is coping with fear taking you into a world of escapism, addiction, or lust? And again, we've, we've talked about some of this stuff in the course of this series. And so what's the first thing I turn to for relief, for my safe place to feel that everything is going to be okay? 
And things can bring comfort, but the comfort that we get will not last. It'll be short of what God has for us. And so he needs to be the one. Say the one. It needs to be the first thing that we turn to. It has to be. And again, I know we can face trials. I know we face challenges. I know I'm not saying that it isn't going to be hard at times. In fact, it's a fight. The Bible calls it what? A fight of faith. And so we need to dig our heels in and choose to believe God, whatever the cost. All right, and so we need to believe that God's our heavenly father and that he wants to provide for us and take care of us. Um, Psalm 91, I'm not going to read all of it, just a few verses today. I would recommend you read it on your own, and I think it describes a safe place, if you will, of freedom uh, from fear and all the attacks of the enemy. Psalm 91, let's read verses 1 and 2. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Think about, first of all, that word abide. It literally means to pinch a tent. It means to live with the Lord. So now this morning, we, we had a great experience here, and, and, and we, you know, we practice and we rehearse, and we want to do good as a worship team, and we've got some gifted people here, and we want the words up there so you can follow along. And, and, and it's wonderful to create uh, an experience, a session like that, whatever you want to call it, but let me assure you that, that that is not the presence of God. Is the presence of God in it? Yes. It's our response to him to the best of our ability as we are seeking him together, but you can't take that with you. It can certainly help us be introduced to the presence of God, but then taking the things that were taught in a session like this will help us to have the presence of God everywhere we go. I just read this week, and I'm sure you did, another very popular worship leader is denouncing his faith. Denouncing his faith. And I saw an article that said, um, what faith are you talking about? I mean, sometimes I think what we've done, here's what we've done, is we've created a place where the show and the experience we believe is the presence of God, and then we can't take that home, and so we question our faith when the trials of life come. Let me assure you, the presence of God is not an experience that we run to. The presence of God is something that we live in. God wants to be there, our comfort, our peace, our rest, our joy in every trial of life. And what we've done is we've turned worship and preaching into entertainment. And, and I, again, I'm not blaming anyone. And as a pastor, I accept full responsibility for what we've done. But what we've turned it into is we've turned it into a show that people have to get to. And, oh, didn't you sense the presence of God there? You did, but did you get what you needed to keep it when you got home? That's the question. And so, and so what we do, I, I, I get a, I'm just going, I didn't share this first service. You're going to, you get this for free. Sweet. I mean, like, like any, anyone would, you know, in, in the world of church business, if you will, you get all kinds of telemarketers and stuff, just like you do with everything, because it's turned into a business. And, uh, you know, that, that's just the truth. There are some good business principles you should apply to church. But, you know, I get uh, different emails and teachings from different pastors and leaders and I remember um, this week I just got one, and, and, and the thing that I got was talking about learning how to preach without our notes, without technology. How could we do that? And it was this big article on preaching without tech. I love technology. I actually like notes, and I put them on here, and sometimes I follow them, sometimes I get off. But the thing is, we've become so dependent on that that we think that's what it is. We think it's, it's, it's the presence of God is in that experience. And that is really a sad state when we've gotten there. And uh, a friend of mine, I saw he posted this just a couple weeks ago. He said, I've learned how to build, and he's a very successful pastor. I have great respect for him. Uh, Lee Cummings, you may know, know him, Radiant Network, Radiant Church, we're part of that network. And he said, I know how to build church, but I want the presence of God. And, and we've learned how to build church and do things but we, we need the presence of God. And the presence of God only comes from abiding, living in the presence of God. And that's something only you can do for you. Shadow of the Almighty. You could really translate that in today's vernacular. Uh, to really, a, a place in God, a home in God, dwelling with God. And so the question is this morning, in life, are you dwelling under the shadow of the Almighty? Is his presence the thing that is taking you from glory to glory to glory? It says that he'll be our refuge. Uh, you think about this refuge, it was something called the law of hospitality, something that God told Moses. 
he was to uh, embrace was the law of hospitality. Remember, the children of Israel were nomads. They were traveling in the desert for some 40 years. And, and the law of hospitality basically was this. If someone was traveling, all right, traveling in the wilderness, in the desert, and they came upon your camp that you had set up, that you would have to offer them shelter, all they would have to do is come to the chief shepherd's tent and pull on the cord. I want you to remember chief shepherd, that's, that's Jesus, is pull on that cord and they would have to keep you sheltered from the blistering sun. Psalm 121, it says that the sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. See, it's a place where you can be safe from all of the attacks of the, the life that we're in. The great shepherd, the chief shepherd. Do I need a new battery in this, perhaps? The woman with the issue of blood. Maybe you know the story. Matthew chapter 9. Uh, this woman had an issue of blood, the Bible says, for 12 years. And here's Jesus, and the multitudes are there, and they're thronging him. What does that mean? Pressing upon him. They're pressing upon him as Jesus walks. And as they're moving along, he says, who touched me? And the disciples said, who touched me? There's this great crowd here, and you wonder, who touched me? And the Bible says there was this woman there, and, and, and can you imagine? She had a, a flow of blood for 12 years. Everybody's laughing over here, so I'm, I'm gonna, am I switching mics? All right. Check, check. Okay. She had a flow of blood for 12 years, and so according to the laws that were in place, she would be considered unclean. So can you imagine fear of rejection, fear of abandonment? Heck, her family probably wouldn't have been around her because they, they considered her unclean. And so here's this woman for 12 years, probably wasted everything she had, uh, tried to get healed by the physicians. And again, there's nothing wrong with doctors and professionals and all that thing. But that's what she went, and she exhausted everything, probably had nothing left, and she reached out. And the Bible says that, let's read this together, Matthew 9, 20. It says, and suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. Touched the hem of his garment. If you study that out, it, it means it was probably would have been a cord or some kind of a, a hem. And, and she reached out and she touched that thing in desperation. Listen, if you're going to live and abide under the shadow of the Almighty, it's not going to come from a church experience. It's going to come from you reaching out day by day and touching the hem of his garment. Getting in his presence, in the word, in prayer, bathing yourself in the truth of God so that when those Moments of fear come, you're prepared. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to be rescued from financial problems. Could be health, relationship issues. Whatever the case is, let me assure you, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Talking about God being our refuge, there was something else that God told Joshua, the next leader in succession from Moses. Moses led them in the... Uh, desert. Joshua took them into the promised land. And God told Joshua to build six cities of refuge. And these were places where someone could run to for safety. For instance, if you killed someone under the law, the members of that family could chase you down, hunt you down, and take your life. All right? But this was a place of refuge for someone who committed some kind of a, a sin, a wrongdoing by accident, and they could go to the city of refuge. And that city would have to take care of you, and they would take care of you until the high priest died. All right, well, that's good news for us because our high priest is Jesus, and he ain't dying. He was the one who was dead and what is alive. How long? Forevermore. He is with us. He won't leave us. He won't reject us. He's always there. We can run to him in the midst of our trial. Hebrews 3, 1, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. See, Jesus can set us free from everything that is in our past that is saying you can't have a good life. Jesus is setting us free from whatever we face. If it's something in our body, again, something in relationships, he is going to restore back to you and I everything that the enemy has stolen from us. In Psalm 91, Moses goes on and he says this in verse 13, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent or dragon. I believe there's three types of attacks that we can talk about there. Number one, the lion. Think about that. It's an attack that's expected. 
If there was a lion right here, how many know you'd think, I'm out of here because that lion is going to eat me? You know what I'm talking about? That's something you expect. You don't expect that lion to stand up on his hind paws or whatever you call it and say, what's up, bro? What's happening? Let's hang out. No, he's going to eat you. It's an expected attack. And so what Moses is telling us by the Spirit of God is God will take care of us when we're being attacked by the lion. L- let, me, let me tell you, you can expect attacks. From the enemy. Expect them in life. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So there's going to be attacks. Expect them, but prepare for them. See, the thing is, we don't prepare for things in life that we should expect. Sometimes there's going to be an attack on your finances. How many know that? Sometimes you are going to have an attack in your relationships, many times your closest relationships. In fact, if you have long-term relationships, lifelong relationships, including marriage, you are going to have attacks in that area. You may have an attack in your health. Every one of us will suffer some degree of attack in our health at some point in our life. And so we should be prepared. We should have an arsenal from the Word of God on how God wants to provide for us financially, how He wants to provide for us and give us good health, how He gives us great relationships and teaches us how to live a life of peace and rest in our relationships. The Word of God is, is, is so rich. It's so awesome, and, and so many of us neglect it, and so many, I'm sorry to say, pastors are turning away from preaching the Word. Again, we're, we're stripping it down, and more and more pastors just preach a message that they can memorize without their notes. <laughs> and there's no scriptures in it. Many preachers, some of them will throw one out, and listen, I'm not, I'm not I, I need some notes. I need the Word of God. I love to take the Word of God. I probably share more scriptures than just about any preacher you can find anywhere. But the Word of God is the only tool that we have that can do this for us. It's the only thing that can teach us and provide for us that we can live under the shadow of the Almighty. So the expected attacks, 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's walking around. He's seeking whom he may devour. <laughs> Pastor Dwayne Vanderklok, good friend of ours, He says this, he says, we like bananas in our family. He says, what's the first banana that gets eaten? The first one off the bunch. See, and so what the devil wants to do is he wants to get us segregated, wants to get us broken apart so that the devil can attack us. The devil will attack those who are split apart. The Bible says that only a fool isolates himself and rages against all wise judgment. We need relationships. We need the word of God. We need teaching. We need prayer. We need worship. We need small groups. We need all these different things that so many times we just fail to embrace in our lives. 1 Peter 5, 9, it says, resist him steadfast in the faith. Number two attack, it says, is the cobra, or we'll just say the snake. What can that be? That, that's the attack that I'm not expecting. How many ever walk in, you know, even just a little garter snake walking across your lawn and whoosh, just withers through there? You don't see it coming. Sometimes in life, anybody ever had an attack, you never saw it come? It's like, my gosh, I never saw that come. See, we can be prepared and be delivered by the attacks we didn't see coming as well. So am I preparing myself for the attacks in life that will come, expected attacks? Am I preparing for the unexpected attacks? Let me just assure you this morning that miracles can strike just as suddenly as an attack does. And you need to believe God for a miracle. If something comes at you and it came out of nowhere and you unexpected, weren't expecting it, you need to say, I'm expecting a miracle. And God, I can get a miracle just as quick as I got this bad report. Some of us are facing bad reports. You need to say, I'm getting my miracle just as quick as I got this bad report in Jesus' name. Because he provides for us for the expected attack, the unexpected attack Paul the Apostle, he's shipwrecked on Malta, and first thing he does, they come to shore, they start to build a fire, and he's picking up sticks to build the fire with. And there's a snake in there, it comes in, it, it bites him on the arm. And listen to what it says here. It says, but he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. I love that scripture, because we already did it today, but we'll just do it here. Say, shake it off. Shake it Say, shake it off. Shake it off. So, listen, and that may seem hard to do, depending on what we're facing, In our trial right now, the fear that we're facing that the enemy is trying to put on us, but we need to shake it off. Somebody say, shake it off. off. 
Don't you let that snake gnaw on you and chew on you. That's what the devil wants to do. He just wants to come at you every day, every waking moment, every moment that you're sleeping. If you wake up in the middle of the night, what he's doing is he's just gnawing at you. This thing you didn't expect, and he'll say, just the way I came when you didn't expect me, I'm going to come and get you when you don't expect me before, and your life is not going to work out well. And what he'll do is he'll hammer us, and he'll attack us, and attack us, and he'll chew, and he'll gnaw. And you just say, shake it off in Jesus' name. I'm expecting my miracle from God. Amen? Amen. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16. The third thing that he said he would protect us from, the expected attack, the unexpected attack. He said he would, ex- he would protect us from the attack of the dragon or serpent. But if you look at the, trans- uh, the, the original root, it's really a sea serpent. Sea serpent. So that's something that's unfounded or something that just doesn't make any sense at all. Sometimes we have attacks that just don't make any sense at all. They're unfounded. Because if you think about it, this was written to a people who were nomads living in a desert. How many know that the chances of, of coming across a sea serpent in the desert it just isn't going to happen? And so it's the kind of attack that just doesn't make any sense. I mean, no, there are expected attacks. There's unexpected attacks. There's attacks that just don't make any sense at all. And so what the devil wants to get you doing and get me doing is he wants us to start worrying about things that probably will never happen. And we say, oh, my gosh, maybe we see on the the news that there was a plane crash. And we think, oh, boy, I got to fly tomorrow. Maybe I should see if I can get a refund on my tickets. Let me assure you of something. You have a 1 in 1.5 million chance of crashing in an airplane. That's just one example, or, or a relative gets a heart attack or, or cancer, and we think, oh, I'm next, and we worry about things that probably won't, could happen, but probably won't. You know that 85%, listen, 85% of the things that you and I worry about will probably never happen. Again, bad things happen. There's expected attacks. There's unexpected attacks, but there's attacks that are just unfounded, and, the, and what the devil wants to do If he can't get you worrying about one thing, he's going to get you worrying about something that will probably never happen. And that's what he does. He gets us on this this path of fear, and it just gobbles up our faith. And we need to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Tell the devil that God loves you and that he's your safe place. Verse 4, Psalm 91, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Think about that for a moment. Again, in a couple weeks, I'm going to start talking about spiritual warfare. My shield and buckler, it's the word of God. It's the thing that that defends us from the attacks of the enemy. But a buckler is a sword that you would wear on your side, and you would do battle with that. Am I prepared to do battle? God will deliver us if we're prepared for battle. The Bible says this in Psalms. It says that the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance comes from God. We're trusting him. We prepare, but we trust God. How do we prepare? We have our shield. We have our buckler. We have the word of God. We have the promises of God. And I'm just sorry to say, in our society, most Christians don't know what the word of God says. If you've come for any number of time to this church, you know that I probably say that statement more than just about anything. And so many Christians don't know what God's promises are. If you you need help reading your Bible, man, we encourage you to get in a small group. Get into a group of friends that can share the word with you. We've got little books that will help you find promises. If you don't know what the Bible says about healing, about finances, about relationships, about all these different issues in life, the Bible is really what we need. It's our, it's, it's our manual for life. What did somebody once say? Basic information before leaving earth. I like that. This is, this is your manual for life. And, and so many Christians, this touches everything, guys. I think people that have never read the Bible, they think, oh, it's just about a bunch of perfect people that didn't even have to walk. They just floated across the earth. No, this is about a bunch of messed up people that God delivered because his promises are yes and amen. Do you realize that the Bible says that God is faithful to his covenant for our sake? God's faithful to his covenant for our sake. But if we don't know what his covenant says about us, how are we going to stand against the attacks of the enemy? When Joshua was entering the promised land, they encountered five kings. Somebody say five. We'll just say that those kings could could really represent our five senses. And this is what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to live by sight and not by faith. But that's not what the Bible says. Come on, somebody. He wants you to get to live by what you see, what you taste, what you smell, what you hear and what you can touch. 
He wants to get you living in the physical, carnal atmosphere of this world. And you can't fight your battle that way. Our battle is spiritual. And God delivers us through his word. So God helped Joshua and his men get deliverance from these five kings who were keeping them back from the promised land. Once they got that deliverance, God said this to Joshua. And he said to his men, do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. See, God wants to assure us this morning that he will defeat our enemies and defeat every enemy that continues to come against us. Again, these five kings are like our five senses. It says, don't be dismayed. Don't be dismayed. That literally means to be torn apart or to fall apart. And you know, so many times, because of what we hear, we heard a bad report. Because of what we smell, what we hear, what we taste, what we can touch, what we can see. We're, we're living by natural means, and our life is torn apart, falling away, if you will, falling apart right before our eyes, if we choose to listen to the enemy. Again, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but what? Of power and love and a sound mind through self-discipline. Through self-disciplining, choosing to think on the promises of God. That is what spiritual warfare is. So the Lord uh, causes a great deliverance from these kings, as I mentioned, and, and, he, and he brings a, a hail down, a hailstorm down, and defeats them. And they're defeating the enemy, and the five kings, they run for shelter, and they hide in a cave. You can read it yourself in Joshua chapter 10. And so they, they run for this cave, and they're hiding in the cave, and, and Joshua says, just seal that cave up. We'll take care of them later. They seal the cave up, and they go, and they continue defeating the army that God has already rained the hailstones on. They finish that job. They come back. The kings are in there. They say, well, roll the stone away. And they roll the stone away, and the first thing Joshua says, they start to bring these five kings out to execute him. He says, stand on their necks. May I suggest this morning you need to stand on the neck of your enemy? Don't you allow the devil to steal one more thought? Don't you allow him to steal one more minute or second of your time? When he comes in, allow God to raise up a standard that resists him steadfastly in the faith. You've got to fight him. You've got to say, no, my God will give me the miracle I'm believing for. My God will provide for my needs according to his riches and glory. I, have, I was young and now I'm old and I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And start to fight him with the word of God and say, I don't care how bad it gets. I was just reading the other day, I love it, Isaiah 44, 44, 45. Isaiah 45, it, it talks about, prom matter of fact, I'm just going to turn there for a minute. Mm -mm -mm. I love Isaiah. Move that over. Oh, my. Went a little bit long. You can blame that on that song Tony wrote. <laughs> you like that song? Isn't that, isn't that a good song? I, I love that. Amen. It's wonderful. Yeah, 44. I was right the first time. It says, I will pour water on him who is thirsty. You don't have to turn there. This is verse 3. And floods on dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing upon your offspring. I prayed this over our family and still do. Every day that our kids are growing up, I said, you are pouring your spirit upon my children and the blessing upon our offspring. That's it, God. That's your covenant. I don't care how crazy things get. How many know kids can be crazy sometimes? All right? And there's another prophet, there's another, sorry, there is another promise in here where it says that God will take care of us even in our old age. And I'm believing God for him to take care of me in my old age. How about you? So not only will he take care of my children, he'll take care of me when I'm gray-headed. Of course, I, I removed the gray hair. You know, I don't have that there. But God will take care of us when we're old. So, yeah, he, so I don't care what it is we're facing. God will take care of you, take care of your children, provide for you in your old age. I was young and now I'm old and I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Something about the number five, again, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch in the natural world. Yeah, God gave us those things and we need them to exist in this, in this life. But we're not meant to be led by our senses. I hope you understand the point I'm trying to make. And we take a look at whatever that report is, something in our natural senses. Let me talk about the number five as the worship team comes back up. Four plus one equals what? 
Well, some of you had good. Four plus one is what? This is elementary school math here. Okay. Number four is the number of weakness and incapacity. Weakness and incapacity. Plus one, which is God's perfection, is five. Five is the number of grace, grace upon grace. Let me tell you something. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 11 that his strength is made perfect in weakness. So when you're facing something that seems way beyond you, you got good news today. That is where God's strength dwells, is in the power of his grace. You think about it. When David met Goliath, does anyone know how many smooth stones he had? It's five. You got five is right. Five. Somebody say grace. grace. Right before he slew Goliath, that's a picture of God's grace. You think about Abraham. Abraham was the man that God first extended his covenant of grace to, and God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And in the Jewish alphabet, the equivalent of H, what number in the alphabet do you think it was? Five. It's a picture of God's grace. Let me just assure you that God will give us the grace that we need to overcome the things in our lives that we can see, that we can taste, that we can smell, that we can hear, and that we can touch. He wants us to have the victory in this life. So let me ask you this morning, what do you feel? So many times we walk by our feelings. I've heard people say things so often, well, I just don't feel like God loves me anymore. Well, I just don't feel like I'm going to do this anymore. I just don't feel like I'm having any victory in my life. If you need to tell your feelings to shut up in Jesus' name because you're not going to win the war that way. You have victory over your feelings. Galatians 5.16, it says, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We talked last week how I really believe that lust and works of the flesh are based in fear. The enemy wants to get us looking at things in the natural. Wants us to walk according to how we feel. You just tell him to shut up in Jesus' name. Number two, what do you smell? I, I love this Lazarus, story of Lazarus, John chapter 11. Maybe you know the story. You probably do. His friend Lazarus is dead, and about four days later, he shows up, and he says, well, move the stone away. And they said, oh, you don't want to do that. By now, he smells. <laughs> I mean, no, he was dead. When you're stinking, you're dead. (laughs) Jesus said, roll the stone away. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. Listen, just because you smell something, there's something in your life that's stinky. All right? You need to speak to that, just like Jesus spoke to Lazarus. I'll share this scripture with you here, 2 Corinthians 2.15. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are, what, perishing. Hmm. So what fragrance am I giving off? When life throws something stinky at me, am I a fragrance of praise? Listen, you can change the atmosphere of your world. You don't even need to have music. Music can help, but you need to abide under the shadow. Oh, I didn't mean to stop playing. If only we could be that obedient all the time, see? That was good. I didn't mean, we. I said we, not you. I said we. All right. <laughs> what do you see? Second Kings chapter 6. You can read it on your own. Elisha's there and his servant is with him. And the Syrian army is surrounding the city. And, and they look like they're going to be defeated because they're far outnumbered. But Elisha says, you're looking at this thing in the natural. You need to start looking at things in the spirit. So God prays that his servant could see in the Spirit. Yes, and you and I need to walk by faith and not by sight. We need to walk according to what the Spirit of God dictates in our lives, not what we see, not what we smell. What about this? What are you hearing? We're going back and forth on Elijah and Elisha today. So this is Elijah. What are you hearing? You think about Elijah. He was the one who prophesied that it wouldn't rain for about three and a half years, and he said it would rain, and it started to rain. We're going to celebrate in the rain today. If it rains and we're baptized, and we're going to celebrate the latter rain of Jesus Christ. Amen? But you can imagine when there's famine, what do you think everybody's talking about? How am I going to feed my family? If there's drought and nobody's eating, that's all you think. So what do you hear? The negative reports of the enemy. You know what Elijah did? He said, I see a cloud. I see a cloud back there. It's a cloud. It's like a man's fist. You can declare the goodness of God and believe God for your rain. You may be living in a place right now that feels like a famine. It feels destitute. It feels dry. Don't listen to that report of the doctor. Don't listen to that report of the accountant. 
listen to the report of the Lord. And then finally, what do you taste? Second Kings chapter 4. Again, this is Elisha. So we went Elisha, Elijah, Elisha. And there's a drought and the prophets are hungry. And so they go and they pick some gourds and some herbs and they put a stew together and they start to eat that stew. And one of the guys says, ah, there's death in that pot. So what, what does Elisha do? Elisha says, go get me some meal. He takes that meal. He throws it in there. That meal is really a picture of the word of God. You're, you're facing something right now and that report tastes bad in your mouth. It tastes like death. But let me assure you, the word of God says, you will live and not die and declare the praises of God in Jesus' name, amen. But we've got to just get ourselves to a place where we start to experience and embrace and dwell in the presence of God in his shadow. As he's the mighty one, he's our refuge. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.